back with comedian David Boyle and I'm quitting alcohol. So we're back with The Process, number 12, episode 12 of The Process, the beginning of the end. I say this is the beginning of the end, but really the beginning of the end was about 10 years prior to this, but this was the beginning of the end where I had no other choice. This is the point where I really had no fucking options left. I just got back from India. I had no job. We had no money. Like literally, I think we had about $800 left when we got back from India after moving into the new place. I had a kid who was not quite one yet. I was fucking backed into a corner. And still it took about two and a half, almost three years from here. From this position, it still took that long. So we got back from India. We set up a place and I wasn't working. I think I was on the dole. No, I don't think I was on the dole. <laughs> I was on the dole. That's right. I got back from India before my wife. And the first thing I did the first day I got back to Australia was sign up for the dole. So I was really in the frame of mind of just like reaching for the fucking stars at that point. I needed to buy some time. That was the thing because I didn't want to go back to fucking making coffees in the hospital in my brown hat. And that was really the only thing I was qualified for at the time. How fucking depressing that is. So I think I spent about six weeks. It was probably more like eight weeks not working, trying to figure out what I was going to do. I started jujitsu. So I was going to jujitsu like twice a day and I was fucking loving that. We were broke. <laughs> We were completely fucking broke, but I managed to scratch enough money together to go to jujitsu twice a day. And then it got to the point where I needed to find something. And my mate, Sean, Shawnee, said he could get me a job as a dogman working with the cranes. And initially, I did not want to do that at all because I thought it would cut into my jujitsu time and my comedy. But these are the sorts of decisions you get forced into when you're not proactive with your life. Because I wasn't giving comedy 100%. I was giving it maybe like 25% and most of that 25% I was going out to gigs and smashing darts and booze. So when I looked deep into myself, I couldn't use comedy as an excuse not to get a job because effectively it was going nowhere. It was looking more and more like a fucking pipe dream. So I sort of got backed into a corner and I'm like, all right, I'll do this fucking crane job. And the drinking at this point, because I had a kid at home and a wife at home, had become just buy a fucking case of beer and smash as many as you can. And a lot of the time it was just me and my wife drinking. So that would lead into fighting. So there was a lot of drinking and a lot of fighting. And then I'd go out to comedy and comedy would be drinking as well. And I'd just stumble home whenever the fuck I wanted to. It was just like a rut. So I got this job working with the cranes and I treated it like every other job I've ever had in my life. I did not give a fuck. I was lazy. I was late. I did not give a fuck about it. I wasn't even trying. I wasn't even appreciative of the fucking job at all. So I was really just plodding along until I got fired. That's pretty much what I was waiting for. Nothing was really happening in any direction. I was on shit money as well, like real shit. I was earning less working with the cranes at the start than I was fucking making coffees. They said they were going to up my pay pretty quickly once I started getting the hang of things. And I think it was like six months in and there was no mention of a pay rise. Not because they didn't want to give me one, because I didn't deserve one. I was useless. So anyway, if there was one incident that I can pinpoint that sort of fucking changed everything for me, it was the Perth Fringe Festival. This was the point where I'm like, shit really needs to change. So I went to the Perth Fringe Festival. I did a show. It was called All Aussie Misfits. It was me, Miles Milson, who's a degenerate alcoholic to this day, Mark Oshka, who's an ex-meth head, and Dom Chapui, who is a current meth head. I don't know if he's on the meth now, but he was then. So we were doing this show and I took like 10 days off work. I told them like three days before I left as well. I'm like, I got to take 10 days off. I'm doing a show in Perth for the Fringe Festival. 
And work was basically like, okay, take as much time as you want because you're about to get fucking fired. So from the very start of the Perth Fringe Festival, it was just a fucking disaster. Miles Milson didn't make it over. He pussied out for some reason. I get over there and Dom's already been there for like a week and he's in the middle of a meth binge. And then Mark gets over there as well and he was meant to organize a place for us to stay because he's from Perth. And the place he had organized, he'd been staying at it and he said, nah man, it's not going to be worth staying here. They're full on junkies and the place is a fucking nightmare. So I ended up staying in a hostel in Perth and the first two shows got cancelled because we didn't sell a ticket and that's depressing enough in itself because I was meant to be in Perth for nine days. I just left my wife at home with the kid to do this fucking festival and the first couple of shows cancelled and then the third show somehow we sold like 30 or 40 tickets and all of us fucking smashed. We all fucking murdered and we just thought we were fucking superstars after that. So we start drinking. Me and Mark go on a fucking massive bender. We lose Dom to meth or something like that. I wake up in the morning at like fucking 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Mark's still there. And I'm like, do you want to kick on? And he's like, yeah. So we just go into the city and start kicking on. I've told this story before. But we both end up getting arrested. I end up getting smashed by a fucking police officer. Mark has some outstanding warrants for assaulting a police officer. So he gets thrown into remand. He ends up spending like a couple of weeks in jail. I get let out. I go straight from jail to... (laughs) I go straight from the lockup to the fucking festival club. And I just start calling everyone in there faggots. So I get thrown out of festival club and banned for life. Like the bouncer came up to me in the festival club saying, we're getting some complaints that you're using homophobic slurs. And I'm like, what fucking faggots have been saying that? (laughs) And they basically just put me in a headlock and threw me out and banned me for life. So I wasn't allowed back in there. Mark's in jail. Dom's on meth. Then the next show gets cancelled. I drink that night, I wake up the next day, Dom's keen to go, so I'm like, fuck it, I'll do some meth with Dom. So then we end up doing meth for like 24 hours, and 24 hours of meth means like 48 hours of no sleep. So I'm in the hostel, I can't sleep, I haven't slept for like, I don't know how long it was. However long 18 wanks is, that's how long I didn't sleep for. We ended up selling a few tickets after the meth binge, And me and Dom are like, we've got to cancel this. I can't fucking talk. Dom's sweating. I'm sweating. My heart's beating out of my chest. Dom's fucked. I'm like, you've got to go on first. He almost had a panic attack. Then he said, no, I can't. You've got to go on first. Then I almost had a panic attack. Anyway, it was just a fucking disaster. I was meant to be there eight or nine days, but I was like, fuck this. It's just me and Dom. Mark's in jail, Miles didn't come, I've got a kid at home and a wife, I'm like, I can't fucking do this anymore, this is, I I just can't do it. So the next day I flew back to Melbourne and I'm like, I really need to make some fucking changes with my life, I really, I really can't be doing this anymore. And the only thing I could think of was my job. I was like, I've got this job, and I was listening to Jordan Peterson at the time, and I remember him saying, if you're such a fucking loser... If you are such a loser, you don't have anything going for you, but somehow you've got a job, you have no right to leave that fucking job. You have no right to leave it for a year, two years. You have no right. And I'm like, well, I am a loser and I do have a fairly decent job. So I made the decision. I'm not going to leave this job for at least a year, probably two. And then another thing Jordan Peterson said He's like, work as hard as you fucking can. If you're going to be there, work as hard as you fucking can and see what happens. See how your life changes. And I'm like, that is a very novel idea. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to stay at this job for a year and I'm going to work as hard as I fucking can. And that's what I did. And I was so fucking lucky because I got back from Perth And my mate Sean, who got me the job, said, man, I think you're fired. And I'm like, no, 
No, not now. Not now. I just went through a life-changing experience. I'm ready. I'm ready. It can't happen now. And then the day before I came back, one of the other crane drivers cracked the shits and fucking quit. So they needed me to stay. So I got fucking saved. And that's what I did. I went back. I worked as hard as I fucking could. I got a pay rise within six weeks. They doubled my money. I learned how to do the job. I no longer felt like I was above anything. I was like, I know nothing about nothing. I'm just going to do this and learn. And I learned and I became a very good dogman. And that gave me a little bit of confidence because I was now employable. I was competent at something. So that sort of helped. But I was drinking still. And the early mornings and the fucking brutal hangovers and the hard work, it was just wearing me down. It was brutal. I wasn't sleeping. I was doing gigs at night. I was waking up at like 4.35 a.m. It was rough. I was falling apart physically. I was never happy either. I was depressed. I was fucking angry all the time. I wasn't home much with the long hours and all the bullshit. And when I was home, I was a cunt. Me and my wife were fighting all the fucking time. It was just unsustainable. I had a couple of extended breaks off the booze during this time. That was when I made the rule, I'm only drinking on holidays. And then we went to New Zealand, camper vanning around New Zealand for a few weeks. And I drank every millisecond of that trip. I made up for the month I took off before it. It was unsustainable. Everything was unsustainable and I had to make a decision. I had to finally decide, the final decision. I had to decide what I wanted, whether I wanted life or whether I wanted to keep drinking, which more or less equated to death to me. So I had to make a final decision and we'll go into that next week. Next week will be the end. The final episode of the process, the end. Anyway, that's it for tonight. If you're enjoying the podcast, share it around with your friends. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and I'll see you the fuck later.